Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. On behalf of the Center for Civil and Human Rights, we're so grateful that you came today. My name is Jen Mason McAward. I'm the acting director of the Center, and I teach here at the law school. It's off? Okay, well, I'll just speak up then. All right, uh, so tomorrow is Super Tuesday, and it's a pretty vigorous presidential primary season. And I think it's particularly important to engage everyone in our community um, around issues um, regarding how to exercise your right to vote um, and to reflect on the ways in which law has been and is being used to encourage people to vote and to discourage people from voting. Um, and so to make some strides for this, um, I'm so delighted to have three of my distinguished colleagues with us today. Diane Pinderhughes, who's a professor of political science, the Notre Dame Presidential Faculty Fellow and Chair of the Department of Africana Studies. Luis Fraga, also a professor of political science, the Arthur Foundation Endowed Professor of Transformative Latino Leadership and co-director of the Institute for Latino Studies, and David Campbell, the Packy JD Professor of American Democracy and the Chair of the Department of Political Science. I also want to thank the broad range of student groups who have supported today's um, panel discussion, including ND Votes, Human Rights ND, College Republicans, College Democrats, Bridge ND, the American Constitution Society, and the Federalist Society. I also want to thank the Center for Social Concerns and the Rooney Center on the Study of American Democracy, uh, which have spearheaded ND votes and put together a number of resources that you can find on the website that's listed above that will help you engage um, in this election season. So now I'm going to turn things over to Professor Campbell, who will moderate today's event and get us started. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for uh, being here today. With uh, the primaries in full swing, the nation and the world is watching America's tumultuous presidential election. And while most of, the, of our attention is focused on who is winning and who is losing, it is equally important for us to ask, who is voting? In recent years, as we'll hear today, some states have actually made it more difficult for people to vote, which raises important questions about the nature of the right to vote, because who votes determines who governs. So today, our panel will discuss the right to vote, its past, its present, and perhaps even its future. And if you'll allow me just to set the context for today's discussion, let me note that um, there's a historical reality that the right to vote, that is who can vote and who cannot, has always been a contentious issue. And you may be under the assumption that the trend over the nation's history has always been toward expanding voting rights. But the story is actually a lot more complicated than that. Um, as detailed in his masterful book, The Right to Vote, the historian Alexander Kisar describes how the story of voting rights in the United States has largely been one of two steps forward and then one step back. And until recently, the trend had been toward easing restrictions on voting. So most dramatically, in 1965, the Voting Rights Act brought an end to America's electoral apartheid. And since then, more incrementally, we've seen voting expand through um, other reforms, including the Motor Voter Law, which made voter registration easier. We've seen other reforms like election day registration, the widespread use of absentee ballots and early voting. We've even seen elections by mail in some states. And while none of these reforms brought America to Sweden-like voter turnout levels, the empirical evidence does suggest that these modest reforms did have modest effects in boosting voter turnout. So that was two steps forward. But in the last few years, there has been, at least arguably, one step back. As we will hear today, for a variety of reasons and through a variety of means, voting has arguably become more difficult in the United States. And these new restrictions do not affect everyone equally. They are more, more onerous on some voters, specifically those of color, those of low income, and also the young. So we'll be hearing all about these themes today, 
from each of our panelists. The plan is for each of our panelists to speak for no more than seven minutes, which is a nearly impossible assignment given the scope of the topic today. After uh, each of our panelists has offered their introductory remarks, um, I will lead a discussion which will include questions from the floor. So as you hear from our panelists, if uh, questions occur to you, feel free to jot them down or keep them in mind. We'll get to that point once uh, we've, we've heard from each of them. Our order today will be uh, first Professor Pinder Hughes, then Professor McAward, then Professor Fry. So I will just turn the time over to Professor Pinder Hughes. Take it away. Thank you, Dave, and thank you, Jim, Jennifer McElroy, for inviting us to uh, participate in this and to frame this panel um, and the, its importance in a period of elections. So I want to use up my seven minutes, so let me say that I'm going to hit three major points today. I'll talk about briefly about American culture and the stigma of race, core elements of the Voting Rights Act, and enfranchisement and disenfranch disfranchisement. So American culture and the stigma of race. Slavery was very much a part of the American nation and was incorporated into and recognized by the Constitution in several instances. The legalization of slavery in the Virginia colonies and its recognition as permanent and inherited from mother to child uh, occurred by the, by the 1660s. Uh, and its importance in the southern colonies, that is, slavery's importance, meant that it was a core element of the nation's economy a century before the Revolutionary War and the Constitution was created. Enslaved Africans were largely conceived of as property, and even those Africans who were free often were subject to being identified as someone's property and dragged into slavery, as we saw in the recent film, 12 Years a Slave. Stigma, being viewed as property, being treated as distinct from other population groups, um, such as whites, discouraged the society from seeing blacks as equal, and most importantly, from having access to rights such as civil, political, or economic rights and status that would allow them power in the American government and politics. So that's part one. Uh, my next is going to be the 65 Voting Rights Act and its four elements. The text of the 65 Voting Rights Act begins an act to enforce the 15th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States and for other purposes. Section 2 of the Act reaffirmed the 15th Amendment of 1870 and limited, and the 15th Amendment, of course, was the right to vote, limited the ability of any state or political subdivision to deny or abridge the right of any citizen of the United States to vote on account of race or color. Section 3 allowed for the appointment of federal examiners in order to enforce the guarantees of the 15th Amendment. I'm using some quotations here. Uh, sections 4 and 5 are the most significant and reviewed as such, and were reviewed as such by the Supreme Court, as Louise Frackett will talk a bit about. Um, and even today remain controversial provisions, especially after the Shelby County decision. Section 4 identified tests or devices by which states or subdivisions in any federal, state, or local election discouraged political participation. It also specified that citizens could not be denied the right to vote. States or political subdivisions of the Attorney General found using such tests and where the census determined that less than 50% of voting age persons were registered to vote on November 1st, 1964 or had voted in the 1964 presidential election were subject to the VRA's Section 5. So if you met those tests of Section 4, then your, your jurisdiction was covered by Section 5. Section 5 required that any state or political jurisdiction that met the test of Section 4A, 4A had to seek agreement from the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia and later the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. Uh, whenever that local jurisdiction tried to administer new voting laws different from those in effect on November 64, the purpose was to ensure that the new law will not have the effect, quote, will not have the effect of denying or abridging the right to vote on account of race or color. Uh, Six states were therefore covered, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, Virginia, and a number of counties in North Carolina were therefore subject to the clearance. That is, you had to submit any new voting law changes to the Department of Justice or to the District Courts of the District of Columbia for approval. Congressional and presidential support for the right of the federal government to intervene in state action and Supreme Court 
affirmation of that authority is what gave the Voting Rights Act such power and significance. That's part two. Then I turn to part three, which is enfranchisement and disfranchisement. Uh, a historian, uh, Pippa Holloway, who's been studying um, what, she, what we call disfranchisement. Her book is uh, Living in Infamy, Fellow Dis Dis Disfranchisement in the History of American Citizenship. In that book, she argues that the, in the post-Civil War South, infamy offered a justification for the denial of citizenship rights to African Americans, a means to disfranchise a portion of the African American population and a rationale for making a distinction uh, or distinctions between different kinds of criminal convictions. White political leaders in the South built on the legal tradition of infamy, but added a racial component associated African Americans with infamy and linking infamous crimes with African Americans. Since <coughs> individuals could be denied the vote, white Southerners developed a strategy of using infamy and criminal convictions to perpetuate and justify the disfranchisement of African Americans. It developed, therefore, into a larger effort in fame and thus disfranchise the race by associating African Americans with criminality, degrading them through legal and extra legal violence, and denying the newly freed slaves the dignity traditionally associated with those deserving of suffrage. So this is Holloway's language in which he argues that um, post-Civil War whites were trying to make sure that blacks could not stay in the electorate and doing that by assigning particular kinds of crimes to them and, and, and therefore associating the notion of not respectful people and not being able, therefore, to vote. So disfranchisement, despite the more recent attention to it by voting rights organizations, is not new. It was, but it would seem forms a continuing basis for addressing, attacking, undermining the status of the newly created black citizens with the right to vote. And, and we're seeing this again. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that the southern states have very large black populations. We've seen that in the primaries, most recently being the South Carolina Democratic primary um, on Saturday, which uh, Hillary Clinton did remarkably well and won about 73% of the vote, uh, partly generated by the very, very large black population in South Carolina. So um, they could form the balance of electoral power in much of the South, and Southern political leaders sought to constrain that. Um, so I guess I'll just conclude at that point. I've made my three points. The role of stigma uh, of slavery in American uh, life, the core elements of the Voting Rights Act, enfranchisement and disfranchisement. So I'll call on you to take, um, if you want more details, you can look at my textbook, new textbook uh, called Uneven Roads, uh, co-authored with several colleagues, an introduction to U.S. racial and ethnic politics, uh, and I have some cards here if you want to get that information. Patterns of racial difference existed prior to the American Republic. Slavery penetrated deeply into the American Republic and the Constitution was, that was designed specifically to protect slavery. Even after the Civil War and the creation of the right to vote, um, that right to vote could not be sustained because of the patterns for the states to undermine voting enfranchisement by <coughs> disfranchisement, explicitly intended to reduce the number of African Americans registered to vote. And more recently, today, even after the 1965 Voting Rights Act was passed and operated for a half a century, we see continuing patterns that challenge what the mid 20th century civil rights legislation reaffirmed the right to vote. So, thank you. As the lawyer on the panel, my job is to give you some context and um, some tools to understand Shelby County versus Holder, which was the Supreme Court's 2013 decision regarding the Voting Rights Act. Um, and to do so, I'm going to reiterate some of what Professor Pinderview Pind said um, so you can understand how the Voting Rights Act works and so that you can understand um, the Shelby County decision. So the 15th Amendment says, the right to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of race. And it gives Congress the power to enforce that right by appropriate legislation. Um, but the 15th Amendment was all but disregarded for the first 95 years of its existence. Um, states imposed preconditions to vote, um, like literacy tests, poll taxes, and grandfather clause. 
that effectively barred African Americans from voting. Um, Congress, um, starting in the late 1950s, started to try and um, deal with that history in the South, um, and finally passed the Voting Rights Act in 1965, August of 1965. Um, and it's regarded as the most effective piece of civil rights le legislation that's ever been passed. The law has several important provisions um, that Professor Pinderhughes mentioned, but I just want to reiterate so you can understand the structure. Um, section 2 um, of the Act bans racial discrimination in voting nationwide, and it allows plaintiffs to bring lawsuits to challenge what they see as discriminatory voting laws. Um, litigation can be quite effective, but it can also be very expensive and slow and ineffective. And it often happens after a contested law has gone into, um, has been implemented. Um, and so under Section 2, the plaintiff, the person who wants to challenge the law, bears the burden of proving either that the law was enacted with discriminatory intent or that it has a discriminatory impact. So Section 2 applies everywhere, but then there's Section 5 of the Act which requires certain jurisdictions to pre-clear any changes in their voting laws with either a federal court or, more often than not, the Department of Justice. Um, Pre-clearance requires the jurisdiction, not the citizen, but the jurisdiction, to establish that the change in law does not have the purpose and will not have the effect of denying or abridging the right to vote. So changing that burden of proof is quite an important thing, because um, it places the cost and the burden on the government itself. Section 5 was a very effective and cost-efficient solution um, for um, voting rights violations. Um, the Attorney General, on average, received about 5,000 um, Section 5 submissions uh, every year, and approved about 99% of them. But still, the Justice Department identified about 40 to 50 discriminatory voting laws every year that it stopped from going into effect. And it is certainly true that it also deterred jurisdictions from trying to implement discriminatory voting laws. So where Section 2 applies everywhere in the country, Section 5 only applies to certain jurisdictions um, that Congress identified in the Voting Rights Act. Um, and so the battle has become which jurisdictions can and should be subject to the pre-clearance requirement. So the Voting Rights Act in Section 4 of the Act um, set a formula that essentially required all of the Deep South to pre-clear their changes in voting rights uh, laws. Um, and Congress reauthorized the Voting Rights Act um, four times, most recently in 2006, but it only updated the coverage requirement twice, most recently in 1975. So the question became whether it was constitutionally permissible for Congress in 2006 to continue to apply the preclearance requirement <coughs> to jurisdictions that, ident that it identified in 1975 or whether Congress was required to update that coverage formula in 2006. And that brings us to Shelby County versus Holbrook, where the Supreme Court said, no, nope, Congress needs to come up with a new way of identifying jurisdictions and setting its coverage formula. Um, so the case raised related questions about how deferential the court should be to Congress when it passes civil rights legislation and what kind of factual record Congress needs to amass in order to justify civil rights um, legislation. So before Shelby County, the court had validated the Voting Rights Act in a series of cases um, and said it's a perfectly rational exercise of Congress's power to enforce the 15th Amendment to create the Voting Rights Act and the court specifically approved the coverage formula um, back in the early 80s. Um, but by the time we got to Shelby County, the terms of the debate shifted. And so what you have the majority saying in Shelby County <coughs> is, look, states have equal sovereignty, and they deserve equal treatment by Congress. And Congress bears the burden of justifying disparate treatment among states. And so even though we're going to look for rational justifications by Congress, 
Congress has to point to current data reflecting current needs as opposed to using decades old data relevant to decades old problems. So Congress said, well, no problem, Supreme Court. We did think carefully about the state of voting discrimination in 2006 and the coverage requirement. And indeed, Congress amassed a substantial record um, regarding the number of voting changes that were blocked in the covered jurisdictions, about 700 between the early 80s and 2006, um, plus another 800 that were withdrawn before the Justice Department ruled on them. And Congress also made findings that covered jurisdictions, when they were sued under Section 2, were more likely to be found to be discriminating than non-covered jurisdictions. So Congress says, look, we found there's good that discrimination is continuing in the covered jurisdictions, and it's worse compared to non-covered jurisdictions. <coughs> the majority said, we know you amassed a sizable record. But A, the record shows that voting discrimination, even though it still exists, is less than it had been back when the Voting Rights Act was initially passed. And B, you didn't use the record to create a coverage formula that was grounded in current conditions. So the court says, look, if Congress had started from scratch in 2006, there's no way they would have used the same coverage formula that they used in 1975. And so the court strikes down the coverage formula in the Voting Rights Act. So when you hear that the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County, that's not exactly precise. Section 2 remains viable. You can still sue a government for any change in voting rights laws that is discriminatory. Section 5, the preclearance mechanism, is still viable, but only in theory. Um, and it's Section 4, the coverage formula, that was ruled invalid. So then the question is, what do we do going forward? What should Congress do, and what can the states do? With respect to Congress, it has the power to fix the problem. Right? It can come up with a new coverage formula to designate what states are subject to preclearance. Um, and there are two bills that have been offered in the House of Representatives that would revise the coverage formula. And indeed, earlier this month, the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, said that he in fact supported one of those formulas that would cover four states. Um, but the problem is, he said, but I need the House Judiciary Committee to rule on it. And the chair of the House Judiciary Committee says, Section 2 is plenty, we don't need Section 5, and so I'm not going to bring the bill up for a vote. So at least this term, um, voting rights is dead on arrival um, in Congress. So with respect to the states, the question becomes, you have all these states that are now free of a preclearance requirement, what are they going to do? Um, most of them in the deep south. Um, and so the response, as Professor Fraga is going to tell us, is they've started to modify their voting laws to make it more difficult to vote. And the claim is that many of those laws um, have a disparate impact on racial minorities. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Fraga. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer and uh, Diane and Dave, for um, bringing us here together. I only have seven minutes for a prepared comments, so I want to get to my point, my central point right away. The enactment of voter identification laws in mostly Republican-dominated states reflect partisan attempts to limit the voting influence of African Americans, Latinos, the elderly, and lesser educated lower income voters. Moreover, the court's decisions that have upheld the constitutionality of some of these efforts, and they've not all been upheld, despite posturing and, and I, I say this with, with full respect in this room and in this building, despite posturing and camouflaging behind the rhetoric of legal theory, are driven by the same partisan intent. There is no precedent for this behavior by state legislatures and the Supreme Court, except, of course, for the policies and practices of the Jim Crow era that were referred to earlier and that were explicitly designed to limit and then eliminate the voting influence of African Americans in the South, and important to remember, Mexican Americans in the Southwest and West. At present, according to the National Conference of State Legislatures, 36 states, 72% of all states in the United States, have enacted voter identification laws. And laws are in effect in 33 of these states. The states of Arkansas, Missouri, and Pennsylvania have recently had their laws struck down, and they're reconsidering them. 
Of these 33 states, 22 states, I won't list them all for you because we don't have time, 22 states, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Eight of these 22 states require photo identification, and the rest require some other documentation. And these are called non-strict laws because if a person cannot present the identification during the time that they're voting, the person can cast a provisional ballot, and it is the responsibility of the electoral official to try to figure out whether or not the person uh, has a legitimate uh, right uh, to vote. In 11 states, there are strict laws. The states are Georgia, Indiana, Kansas, Michigan, North Dakota, Tennessee, Virginia, Texas, and Wisconsin that require photo identification, and Arizona and Ohio that require non-photo identification. And, and in these strict law voter identification states, one can cast a provisional ballot if you don't have the identification at the time of voting but it is the responsibility of the voter to return to an election office within a few days and present the required proof of identification. So it's a shift of who had the burden to be able to present. The myth of voter fraud. The justification given by proponents of voter identification laws is voter fraud. But what exactly is voter fraud? And most importantly, as an empirical social scientist, what's the pervasiveness of voter fraud in the first place? Well, Justin Levitt, professor at the Loyola Marymount uh, Law School, in a report for the Brennan Center for Justice uh, at the NYU Law School, defines voter fraud as, quote, what occurs when individuals cast ballots despite knowing that they are ineligible to vote in an attempt to defraud the election system. I think we would all agree that's a pretty good definition of voter fraud. There is virtually no evidence that this type of voter fraud occurs in the United States. It's very important to distinguish between voter fraud and errors in voting that occur because of inaccurate tallies, inaccurate tallies due to fraud by election officials, user error, technical malfunctions, legal conviction with inaccurate information about whether or not previously convicted felons have the right to vote, missing ballots, dare I say Supreme Court decisions not to count hanging chads. Um, these may all be irregularities that's a reference to. 2000. But these are not what were just defined as voter fraud. These are problems in our voting system, no question. And there's likely that individuals, because of these irregularities or more importantly inefficiencies, are voting who perhaps should not vote, but it's not voter fraud. Errors in poll books, errors in registration records, bad matching due to underlying data, partial matches, birth date problems, inefficiencies in death records, criminal records, return mail, unusual addresses are why most votes occur that should not occur, but not actual voter fraud. So what is the, what did we know about the actual empirical evidence of the instances of voter fraud? In 2000 and 2002, in Missouri, after an extensive review, four people, in all elections held in Missouri in 2000 and 2002, four people, six instances of voter fraud, voter fraud rate of careful here, 0.0003%. In New Jersey, 2004, an allegation that 4,397 people voted twice and that 6,572 voted elsewhere after thorough review by election officials, eight cases of voter fraud, a rate of 0.0002%. In New York, a voter fraud rate, this is New York. I suspect it's not Illinois, it's not Chicago, but it's New York. 0.0000009%. Two cases in New Hampshire. In Wisconsin, seven cases, voter fraud rate of 0.002%. In my former home state, Washington State, a challenge was made to 1,668 registered voters with a claim of voter fraud based upon foreign sounding names. None of those were found to be valid. In King County, there was an allegations of voting by non-citizens. Two cases were found a voter fraud rate of 0.002%. There's more evidence of registration fraud and vote buying by election officials than there is of actual voter fraud. So what's the reason that we have voter identification laws that are defined uh, on the basis of, that are defined on the basis of, um, voter fraud. One minute. 
Royal Masser, the former political director of the Republican Party of Texas, concisely tied all of these strands of concern in a 2007 Houston Chronicle article where he said the following, quote, among Republicans, it is an article of religious faith that voter fraud is causing us to lose elections. He doesn't agree with that, but does believe that requiring photo IDs could cause enough of a drop off in legitimate Democratic voting to add perhaps as much as 3% to the Republican vote. So what's the reason for focusing so much on voter fraud and voter ID laws? It is an explicit attempt to try to affect the distribution of which party wins and which party loses. Now, I've had the great fortune, last comment I'll make in my life, of having been involved in voting rights since graduate school. I had the chance to work as a research assistant on voting rights cases for Chandler Davidson, one of the first expert witnesses on voting rights cases. Most of I had a chance to submit uh, with three law professors and two other social scientists, an amicus brief, and the Shelby v. Holder decision, where we amassed the empirical evidence for the need from, social, from a social science and legal perspective for continuing coverage. Um, not surprisingly, the majority opinion, and neither did the minority opinion, cite anything that, that we wrote and submitted in our amicus brief. Um, I worked on a, a research essay that in 2006 was cited by the Senate Judiciary Committee looking at more information requests that came out of the Justice Department. This is when a jurisdiction under Section 5 sends a request to change the jurisdiction, the, the uh, um, um, division, the voting rights section of the Civil Rights Division of the, of the Justice Department, then looks at the request, doesn't deny it, but asks for more information by sending a letter for the first time ever, the first study ever done, and we found exactly the same pattern of the need for greater coverage over jurisdictions that were currently covered under the Voting Rights Act. Most recently, I was an expert witness in a Section 2 case in the city of Wumpus versus the city of Yakima in Washington, where we won summary judgment in 2014. Summary judgment in a Section 2 case? Summary judgment from a federal district judge that said that the evidence of vote polarization was so overwhelming that there was a need for uh, changing the election system to single member districts. The point that I'm trying to make here is it's hard, hard to accept and acknowledge that voter fraud and many of the other types of actions reinforced by our court are driven by explicit intent and partisan gain. But if we don't call the reality or what it is, then I think it inhibits our ability to do what has always been necessary, given everything we've heard on this panel so far about the need to remain particularly vigilant with regards to access to the ballot and the equality that is allowed or denied through access to the ballot. Very famous political scientist E. Schatzneider said in 1960, quote, the grand strategy of politics deals with public policy concerning conflict. This is the ultimate policy. Well, that's what voting rights deals with. It's the ultimate public policy. It's who has access and who can influence our democracy. It's a question of simply how inclusive or fair we want our election system to be. Voter ID laws and related voter fraud give us a very clear indication of which position we might take as individual voters, interestingly enough, in deciding which set of preferences we want dominating our governing institutions, including our courts. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you to all of our panelists for uh, such an informed set of comments. And I'm pleased to note that they all stayed uh, more or less within the time frame we made out, which is an accomplishment in and of itself. Um, as I said, we will um, have questions from the floor, but I thought I might prime the pump a little and just start off with my own question, uh, maybe get some interaction among the panelists. I want to ask about um, the, the consequences of the various changes that have been described. Luis started to talk a little bit about what effect the Shelby decision um, <coughs> has had on the uh, American electorate, but. I think there's probably more to be said, so I'll just leave that open if anyone wants to talk about what the consequences have been and what they might be in the future. Well, I can start. Um, 
Professor Fraga was talking about voter ID laws. And I think it's easy for people who sit in this room to think, how hard is it to get a driver's license or some kind of photo ID? That's not a big deal. You can get them for free, right? Though some of the laws even provide for free voter ID. Um, but it turns out that there's a substantial number of people who don't have voter IDs or any kind of photo ID. And those people tend to be elderly and minority. Um, and even when a state provides free photo IDs, it requires somebody to go and say, get their birth certificate. Well, it turns out you need to pay money to get your birth certificate. So the claim that photo ID is easily available and free is actually belied by the facts. And it is clear that that requirement has a disproportionate impact on the population that was intended to be protected um, by Congress. And well, and that even that process is much more complicated. It can be more complicated in the sense of where the voter right, you know, where do you go to get uh, to register to vote? And a number of states have moved those, made them much less accessible than has been the case in the past. Uh, if you are elderly and you're born in you were born in a southern state like Mississippi or Alabama in a rural area, uh, there may not be um, a birth certificate available to you. It might be very hard to find it or to get it even if you can pay for it. Uh, so, and then the, the transportation of going to those locations are important. I think um, the day after the Shelby decision was handed down, some states like North Carolina and, and Texas began to pass uh, these restrictive uh, voter ID requirements, uh, literally the day after. So for all those who said, well, it's really, you know, it's not necessary to have this legislation in, pla in place anymore, um, if the day after you change something and what you say you wanted that registration or that uh, legislation to protect against begins to be enacted by some of those same jurisdictions as you said were covered, it suggests that the Voting Rights Act had a role. Section 5 had an important role for many years. It's important to understand, it, and I know many of you know this, that most of the, um, if you will, taking a step back if not taking a leap back, with regards to voting rights, and I would describe Shelby as taking a leap back, not just, not just a step back. There have been five to four decisions. It's the reason that we know with the, the unfortunate passing of Justice Scalia that we have such, such tension on our court. Um, but that pattern of five to four decisions on voting rights cases that led to a path of restricting the coverage of voting rights, contrary to what its pattern had been before, that path of five to four started, I would say, in the, in the most current era, in 1993, with the decision of Shavi Reno, where the language used by Justice O'Connor to justify, now we all know the case of Shavi Reno, you have this squirrely line that was there, right, the uh, jurisdiction that if you open the door of a car, the joke was, right, you would, you would hit most of the voters in the jurisdiction, and it was actually done by the, North, the Democrats and the North Carolina legislature as a way to, tr to reserve as many Democratic seats and as many African American voters and predominantly white districts and so forth. But that decision, language was used that questioned the validity of race and ethnicity in our system of political representation. And Justice O'Connor used language like promoting stereotypes and promoting balkanization and splitting up our country. That is, to the extent that race was used as a way to validate representation and allow for access and influence in governmental decision making, given the history of exclusion for over 80 years, 1877 to 1965, by the year of Jim Crow and Black Codes, that that language is the language that continued to be adopted and set a tone for how the court was going to respond. Plus, briefly, including in this instance, you have to remember that our current Chief Justice of the Court, not an easy thing for me to say, an actual classmate of mine in college. We didn't know each other, we tended to be on different lines of political <laughs> arms. Um, had been writing since the time that he was a clerk on the Supreme Court about the evils of the use of race in our system of political representation. And the need for the court to be very, very thoughtful and careful if it was going to embrace 
any type of decision that would lead to greater political influence. And we see this path starting in starting in 93, and we see this path of decision making continuing. I worry about the extent to which it's sending a message to the country that this sort of exclusion is okay because you can find constitutional grounds for justice. Uh, if you're taking notes, you can have a nice little flowchart here from this case that uh, Professor Frager mentioned, Shaw v. Reno, which was about redistricting in, uh, in the state of North Carolina. You can draw a link from that to the Shelby County decision that we heard about. And that, in turn, has led to the consequences that have been discussed about voter ID laws, although there might be actually other uh, restrictions or regulations on voting that, uh, that either have or could be brought about because of uh, the Shelby County decision. So it's a nice example of how law and what actually happens on the ground politically uh, intersect, that what happens in the court is not merely some abstract stuff that doesn't actually affect day-to-day -day, uh, doings. It, it does, and certainly in this case, uh, we have evidence that it has. Um, why don't I turn now to you, the audience, and ask if anyone here has a question for our panel. But just a reminder, I'll call in just a second, just a reminder that a question ends with a question mark. <laughs> you all know what I mean. Go ahead. So thanks a lot for coming in and taking the time to talk to us about this. Uh, your talking points seem to be mostly based on race. My question is not. Um, I think that on all ends of the spectrum, there's issues that reasonable people can disagree and discourse is important. But I also think that there's a lot of things you know, with the internet, um, 30 seconds on Facebook, maybe it'll show you that there's these ideas that, that don't deserve a spot, maybe, um, in our election discourse, uh, things based on race or hatred, things along those lines. Um, and so with the big push to make sure that everyone has and is exercising their right to vote, is there or should there be a concurrent push to make sure that they're being educated on the actual implications of that vote and then the importance of what their say can have? Absolutely. Um, of course, you know, we're all, as voters, this is, this is our power, right? And so our call is to be educated well. And so I think the ND Votes push on campus is really, it's a nonpartisan effort um, that is seeking to help inform people on the issues. Um, so that they can make their own conscientious choice when it comes to voting. So I, um, I think that there are tools here that we have for each one of you um, to inform your consciences um, before you vote. We're one of the few countries, the democratic countries in the world, that has an opt-in system of voter registration. In most democratic countries in the world, it's the government respons government's responsibility to register your vote. You know why? because the government is supposed to hear your voice. So it provides you every, it says, here, everything you can do to be able to participate. That's our responsibility as public entity uh, to do that. We have a very different system. Um, 11 million otherwise qualified Latino voters are currently not registered to vote. Only about 51% of otherwise qualified Latino citizens over the age of 18 who have not been convicted of a felony and are therefore disenfranchised are not registered to vote. Just over 50% of Asian American voters, citizens, qualified to register, are not registered to vote. African Americans are registered at much higher levels. Whites are registered at much higher levels. We have a more fundamental problem than casting informal votes. We have a challenge as a democracy of allowing our public to just have the chance to cast the vote. And we choose not to do that. We, cho we choose a different path. Now, don't get me wrong. Democrats don't support massive enfranchisement as much as Republicans don't support it because it's unknown what the consequences will be. I think we pay a price as a society by not doing more to give us all a chance to participate within our community. Yeah. Um, so, Professor Kumrick, you mentioned the uh, use of uh, criminalizing um, African Americans as a way of like excluding them from society. How does that play into? Uh, we talked a lot about voter ID laws, but how does that, uh, like the felon disenfranchisement, play into this debate about the right to vote? Well, 
Well, it's a very, uh, thanks for that softball, uh, it's a very <laughs> <laughs> core part of it in the sense of uh, states that uh, pass uh, legislation that someone who is convicted of, of a felony, therefore, is not uh, eligible to vote. And depending on how that law is administered, uh, so in some instances, you may be perpetually, that's forever, disfranchised. Um, I don't know if it's changed. Florida might be one of those states. Um, some states, you may be for a period of time, but after you serve time and you come out, you may be forgiven that right. Uh, but obviously, if you are a felon and in the, in the state's laws forbid felons from participating, or if it creates even a process that you have to go through in order to be able to be qualified for voting, that's going to minimize or limit access to the polls because people will, depending upon how complicated that process is, find it more or less difficult to do it, some may be more or less inclined to pursue it. Um, so in the same way that um, we've uh, seen there's been a history of efforts to limit the access of people of color to the polls, if you're able to uh, impose or to sit down and think about well, what can I do to make you know what can we do to make sure that there's less access based on the population that we don't want voting. Uh, and when you're talking about states like Alabama or Mississippi in the late 19th century, people actually did that. And unfortunately, it seems as if they're doing that today. But uh, you know, I'm I'm saying seem because I'm not going to make that direct accusation since I don't have the evidence. But if we sit down and think about how can we limit access to the polls by race, by ethnicity, um, if you create um, legislation that is related to the kinds of things people may do to engage in, um, uh, they may be uh, subject to um, uh, uh, prosecution. And one of the, th one of the things that um, the Holloway book discusses is that in a number of cases, um, limitations on voting was based not so much on felony, but, but even on, um, on misdemeanors. So expanding the definition of what a, a crime was, so that if you make a misdemeanor um, a subject to disfranchisement, boy, you found a lot of, you exclude a lot of people from that. So there's one story she tells about um, making chicken stealing um, a felony, a disfranchising crime, whether it was felon felonious or not. And the assumption being that African Americans in the 19th century could steal a chicken. Um, or maybe somebody could accuse them of stealing one of those chickens, and therefore be excluded from the polls. But any kind of law, any kind of violation of a crime could be used depending upon the intent of the legislation, or the legislators in question. So um, the work by um, um, on the uh, the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander uh, is a very important example of this. There was huge numbers of the population, not just by uh, African Americans, but definitely including African Americans, because of drug laws and various um, such violations. Which, given the spread we've been hearing about recently of of um, heroin and, and meth in rural um, areas of states like Indiana. Um, uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, this could have an impact on white population as well. But so in the past, it's primarily been influenced, had an influence on the African American population. So the New Jim Crow is an example of that argument of, um, she's talking about the, the, the incarceration issues, but along with that goes voting rights issues. Thank you. Uh, in the front. Um, so since we're taking just to uh, immigration, what will that be? in allowing individuals who are currently documented access to the ballot. Do you believe that the lack of bipartisan efforts to have immigration reform is due to just the lack of bipartisan efforts to uh, give everyone the access to the ballot? Also because when you have a high influx of individuals who meet Latinos, not as historically as African Americans, but tend to lean left, so you don't see bipartisan efforts to have immigration reform because then that would give them access to the ballot. Uh, do you think the lack of that immigration reform is due to those to those implications 
Um, from several, several dimensions to your question. Um, I think that the demographic shifts occurring in the country that are in part driven by immigration serve as a context within which many people define their views as to how inclusive a society we want. 94%, 94% of all Latinos, as an example, under the age of 18 are born in the United States. 800,000 Latinos turn 18 every year. There is a way of dramatically impacting the distribution of votes across the country if this community simply mobilized its young or rather political parties and candidates chose as part of a broader community effort to mobilize their young. Um, so there's a way of understanding now about 45% of those 800,000 are born to parents who are nonsense. So imagine what the, the, how different the debate might be on the possibilities of comprehensive immigration reform if you had a set of mobilized voters who were very interested in trying to use their influence to get comprehensive immigration reform to occur. One final quick point I'll make. There are some studies that show that those immigrants who naturalize have very, very high voter registration and participation rates. So the process of inclusion, the process of naturalization, the requirement, as I think is entirely appropriate, of the nation, the requirement that people formally declare their allegiance to the new state is a very welcoming message that immigrants hear and that they express in terms of mobilization. Does that work to the advantage of the Democrat or the Republican Party? Depends upon the group of immigrants, depends upon the state. There's a way, I think, of organizing this um, uh, uh, to allow for both parties to see a potential benefit of being much more inclusive. Um, we have, by the way, a special dispensation. You may have noticed on the poster that this uh, session was scheduled to go until 1.30, but we lobbied and we actually can go all the way to 1.40-ish. <laughs> <laughs> Stretch this out. It's an important discussion. Um, why don't we go with the question here? Um, so you talked about the limits to access, so um, voter ID is the one that's pretty huge. I'm wondering if there uh, are any, I guess, some other appropriate limits that you could envision that would strike a good balance between um, inclusion, broader inclusion, but also other concerns uh, if there are any. So uh, I know, for instance, or I just had a conversation with someone about Canada that votes online or some Canadian jurisdictions vote online. Would that be something that we could envision as a, as a sort of broadening of the access? It, it could if, um, if we could, if we had greater confidence at this point, and maybe Canada has figured it out, uh, um, limits to hacking and other other sort of software influence, voter fraud, of uh, an electronic um, that might occur. Um, some states vote by mail. There's the expectation that in voting by mail, more people would vote of all different voters. And there's very little evidence that, uh, that voter participation rates actually go up as a result of voting. It sure is much more convenient uh, but than having to go on a particular election. Um, I think it entirely appropriate, entirely appropriate, that every individual who casts a vote be required to show identification. Entirely appropriate if the government provides the identification to each of those individuals. It seems to make sense to me, right? Everybody knows what the rules are. The government identifies all the people who are qualified. You know, there's a massive attempt at and funded attempt right to provide, and then you require that that identity, and then you have systems that are maintained, computer you know, systems that are maintained, that allow for checks, appropriate checks for individuals, and so forth, to be able to do that. It's not rocket science to know what to do. And in fact, if you look at the differences in voter participation rates, once someone under our current system, once someone is registered, you have a selection by once someone is registered, the likelihood that they'll turn out goes up dramatically. So we just have this, this glitch. And of course, the decisions that are made by the courts and the voter ID laws and so forth that make it more difficult. But I don't see it as a terrible problem to resolve. It's a question of political will and political risk. <laughs>
from entrenched parties and leaders. And I'm not sure how to overcome that. Perhaps in some massive attempt by the public to say, we want to be heard. So North Carolina is actually a really interesting example because in the early 2000s, it had one of the lowest rates of voter participation. And then they enacted a series of laws, which did things like allow for same-day voter registration. It allowed for 16 and 17-year-olds to pre-register to vote, so they're ready to go when they're 18. Um, it allowed, if you mistakenly submitted your ballot in one precinct, it allowed your ballot to be counted in the proper precinct. Um, and it expanded the number of early voting days. Um, with those changes, it went to one of the states with one of the highest rates of voter participation. So we know what works. Um, in 2013, after Shelby County, all of those laws were repealed. Um, and so the effect of those repeals is now being challenged under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. They went to trial this summer, um, and it's we'll see. Uh, well, it's still in trial in North Carolina. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it goes to the court at some point. Um, but I think North Carolina shows us what works, um, and it shows us the impact that Shelby County. Uh, go ahead. Um, so this was a rather complicated question, so forgive me if I, if I butcher it. But in my home state of South Carolina, um, I was fortunate enough to do some research of redistricting in my hometown. Um, and it's split about 70-30 majority white versus the rest minorities. Um, and I couldn't escape the sinking feeling while I was studying it that in light of all of the horrible abuses of voting rights that had taken place in the past in my hometown, our current system um, effectively has some of the same effects in that you will have, you will, from majority minority districts that we kind of carve out very specifically, you'll have one representative and there'll be three from the other counties. And then another place you'll have one representative and there'll be three from the rest of the district. And so most of the representatives who represented the majority in the state legislator ran for office without having to win a single um, minority vote and had no, um, and I would talk to them and they would say, well, I don't really have to be responsive to the concerns of those communities. So there was a part of me that was torn, kind of a darn if you do, darn if you don't. I wondered if you could speak maybe to the, the prevalence of uncontested elections that is kind of the status quo, at least in, in, in my home state and some of the neighboring states, that leads to some interesting <laughs> corollaries, even though in, in theory there is, a, there is representation. So what town are you from? I'm from Greenville. <laughs> so the northern? Yeah. Mountains. Right. Okay. Um, so I understand the case you're making for uh, an electorate and a representative, a system of representation that requires um, the person in office to pay attention to the interests of the entire community. Um, They've been, in the early days after the Voting Rights Act was passed, there weren't very many majority minority districts. Um, and there also weren't very many minority voters or elected officials either. So starting in the late, mid-70s and early 80s, the uh, voting rights bar began to push for um, this idea of creating <coughs> larger districts. In fact, uh, Frank R. Parker, who was a, uh, very much in, involved in voting rights issues and all sorts of issues in Mississippi, uh, made the argument that in order to have um, uh, the opportunity for blacks to elect a representative of their choice, the district had to be something like 55 to 60 percent black. Um, Mississippi is probably one of the stronger, one of the more difficult states, and so maybe not every um, state you have that requirement. But there just weren't a lot of people elected in the election. So they began to push for that. Um, and the uh, 82 extension of the FBI, um, they that group came to Washington to argue that there should be majority minority districts and that the, um, one of the cases that had been decided, uh, uh, which struck down um, a, the idea that it should be supported. They were able to get that incorporated into the um, into the 82 extension under certain circumstances. You had to have a history of discrimination. You had to have a history of um, uh, uh, voting that 
polarized voting, and there was one other uh, 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 term which I'm not going to remember right now. So they began in the by the 19 mid 1980s to create these voting uh, districts that were majority black, and majority. At that point, they were majority black. Then you know, have majority Latino districts. So you started to see, you know, 1990 huge increase in the number of um, members of Congress. Uh, and people make the argument, I do understand the argument, that you know, there should be a broader um, uh, drawing of districts. It shouldn't be just Democrat. What, if, what it turns out to be is primarily Democrats in the majority minority district. Um, if you were to ask, if you were to survey uh, black voters, they would probably say, well, yeah, I might like that principle of equality and I'd be able to influence the the legislators in a broader array in my um, state, but I'd like to have somebody who pays money. And I think that's what the, that's the way in which the policy and the support for this policy has evolved from um, uh, black elected officials, of course, uh, but I think from black organizations and um, black interest groups that, uh, or minority interest groups, so the Fisher Conference on Civil Rights, which is a a very broad array of, of um, groups of all kinds. So um, it's a it's a troubling philosophical question. Uh, it's, a, it's a troubling um, uh, question in general, which, for which one answer is you get somebody who can represent African Americans. That person may not have to compete in the same way that others do. It absolves the other uh, elected elected officials in the neighboring districts from the kind of competition they have to be. But it's a it's a paradox. And that's what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> there are probably some other things. Are there other thoughts? On the same question. I'm sure there's a This has been a big issue for a long time. So I mean, is an influence district better than one that is a majority minority district? And, and how, how should one try to balance the interest? Um, vote polarization is the key. So um, if you don't have vote polarization, you don't have a need for majority minority districts. Majority minority districts are there because of the history of vote polarization. But I don't know what things have changed. What if folks are not as race bound in their voting as they were before? Shouldn't we try this? Maybe. Depending upon what the evidence is that folks aren't as race bound in their in their decision making, right? And, and allow for more. There are some interesting ideas out there. There's a group called Fair Vote that's calling for ranked choice voting. Single member districts are bad. You should have ranked choice voting or cumulative voting or limited voting, these other schemes that exist, right, to allow for preferences to still be maintained, but allow for the aggregation of those preferences to be by race, if that's what folks want to do, either white or black, maybe by neighborhood, maybe by region, maybe by race and region and so forth, and there should be more flexibility in that system. Um, is it horribly complicated to have systems like that? No, there are communities, there's some evidence that have used them, and it doesn't seem to be an overdue burden on the lesser educated uh, voter. Um, people pretty much understand their interests, pretty simple to understand how it works. Um, but when you get rid of geography as a basis of representation, I wonder what impact that has on policy decision making, and how you understand your responsibilities to serve your particular constituencies. And do you become more race bound because you won on the basis, if you're running in such a system, on the basis of racial aggregation, of whether it's white or black or Latino or, or Asian, you then always have to run as that type of Kimball, then aren't you back to the same sort of system? Well, I think there's room for experimentation, uh, but we have to be very thoughtful in adopting this as part of our law, given the way in which, in my view, geography is an important part of representation in addition to other dimensions that one might not have privilege. Well, folks, um, I did promise that we could go into overtime, and we have, but the whistle is about to blow. So just before we conclude, let me uh, first of all, at the very end of my remarks, ask you to uh, help me to thank our panelists to hold off on the applause, because there are two points I want to make quickly before we do that. Uh, first, um, if I could, I thought I might just weigh in um, on what we know from the empirical literature on 
the electoral consequences of making voting easier. Because as Professor Fraga mentioned in his remarks, there's this assumption, I think, frankly, both Democrats and Republicans, if you make voting easier, it favors the Democrats. Um, turns out the empirical evidence on that is not clear at all. In fact, if anything, the evidence points uh, in the direction of making voting easier actually disadvantages both parties because it uh, can favor uh, either third party or other sort of non-traditional uh, candidates. There's a lot of reason to think that Jesse Ventura, if you remember Jesse Ventura, the professional wrestler, uh, that um, he was a third party candidate in Minnesota and likely won because of election day registration. So uh, that's kind of an interesting little empirical result. And putting the specific case of Jesse Ventura aside, it is clear that um, if you look at, again, the empirical evidence, it's not obvious that one side is favored over the other when uh, voting is made easier. Let me um, conclude by noting that if you are unsure whether you are registered to vote, or you're sure that you're not, and you'd like to be, um, you can consult socialconcerns.nd.edu, where there is a vast website of resources for you to, uh, first of all, uh, register to vote and also to learn about the uh, various issues and questions revolving around our election this season. So again, socialconcerns.nd.edu, uh, there's a whole page there on uh, voter registration and other resources for voters. We will conclude on that note. Please join me in thanking our panelists for a stimulating discussion. <laughs>